As human beings, our innate capacity for love is evident from the moment we are born, as we are often surrounded by it. However, it is disheartening to observe that some individuals, regardless of the love they may or may not have received in their early years, opt for a path of hatred. This choice to harbor hatred can lead to perilous consequences for both their communities and ultimately themselves. In this video, I am going to be taking you through what happens to racist killers in jail. Joseph Paul Franklin. Through the late 1970s and early 1980s, Joseph Paul Franklin was on the rampage killing at least 22 people, mostly people of color and Jewish descent. Basically, X marks the spot for anyone who is not white, but that's not all. Franklin's sinister activities extended beyond murder as he confessed to the attempted assassinations of prominent figures, including magazine publisher and pornographer Larry Flint in 1978 and civil rights activist Vernon Jordan in 1980. Remarkably, both victims survived these attacks though Flint was left permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Joseph was born on April 13, 1950 as James Clayton Vaughn Jr., the eldest son of James Clayton Vaughn Sr. and Helen Rao Vaughn, and had siblings Carolyn, Marilyn, and Gordon. Vaughn's father, a World War II veteran and butcher, left the family when James was just eight years old, leaving behind a trail of abuse and trauma. Helen Vaughn, James's mother, was described as a strict, perfectionist lady of full-blooded German descent. As he progressed through high school, he developed a fascination with Nazism. His Affiliations with extremist groups began with memberships in the National Socialist White People's Party and the Ku Klux Klan. In a symbolic move, he changed his name to Joseph Paul Franklin, merging the names of Paul Joseph Goebbels, a key figure in Nazi Germany, and Benjamin Franklin. He was also influenced by Hitler, Donald Duke, and all of the other racists you can think of. His criminal activities were primarily funded through bank robberies and, strangely, paid blood bank donations, which ultimately led to his capture by the FBI. In a reign of terror that began in 1977, Franklin left a trail of violence across the United States. Then on August 20, 1980, Franklin killed two black men, Ted Fields and David Martin in Salt Lake City, Utah, leading to the police hot on his tail and first-degree murder charges against him. After the murders, in Utah, Franklin continued his deadly journey, traveling through Kentucky. However, he was soon detained and questioned by authorities regarding a firearm found in his car. He managed to escape during this interrogation, but investigators uncovered enough evidence in his vehicle vehicle to raise suspicions about his involvement in the sniper killings. His distinctive racist tattoos and his peculiar habit of visiting blood banks caught the attention of law enforcement. Consequently, a nationwide alert was issued to blood banks. In a crucial turn of events, a Florida blood bank worker noticed Franklin's tattoos and alerted the FBI. This tip led to Franklin's arrest in Lakeland on October 28, 1980. During his 1997 Missouri trial for the murder of Gerald Gordon, Franklin attempted to escape. However, he was caught and convicted convicted of the murder. Psychiatrist Dorothy Otnow Lewis, who extensively interviewed him, testified that she believed he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and was unfit to stand trial. She pointed to his delusional thinking and a history of severe childhood abuse. In an unexpected twist in October 2013, Larry Flint called for clemency for Franklin, arguing that a government that condemns citizen killings should not engage in state-sanctioned executions. Soon after, CNN conducted an interview with him and published it on November 19, 2013. According to him, he felt like I was at war. The survival of the white race was at stake. I consider it my mission, my three-year mission. Same length of time Jesus was on his mission, from the time he was 30 to 33. When asked if he regretted his decision, he was a bit penitent, even though according to Bonterre, he was unblinking and empty as he talked about his victims. Joseph went on to say, yeah, I regret the fact that I shot them now. He went further to renounce his racist views and said that he had interacted with black people in prison and realized they were people like him. However, it was too late. His execution was set for November 20th, 2013. He was to be lethally injected. The German drug manufacturer, Fresenius Kabi, refused to provide their drugs for the lethal injection, so Missouri announced they were going to use a drug provided by an unnamed pharmacy. A day before the execution, a stay was granted due to skepticism about this new drug compound. Then a second stay was granted due to Franklin claiming that he was mentally incompetent to be executed. Both stays were rejected. By the appeal and Supreme Court, and his execution went as planned. His execution went on. No final statement, no words. He blinked a few times, breathed heavily, and swallowed hard. Then the heaving of his chest slowed and finally stopped. 
John King. On June 7, 1998, James Byrd Jr., a 49-year-old man, innocently accepted a ride from three men, Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John King. John King had just come back from prison, and while there, King had claimed that he was repeatedly raped by black men, which fueled his hatred for African Americans. Barry, who knew Byrd from their small town, was at the wheel. Instead of taking him home, they drove him to a desolate county road outside town, where they subjected him to a horrific ordeal. Bird was brutally beaten, his face spray-painted, and he was defecated and urinated upon. The three men then chained him by his ankles to their pickup truck before mercilessly dragging him for approximately three miles along Huff Creek Road. Brewer later claimed that Barry had slashed Bird's throat before the dragging began, but forensic evidence suggests that Bird desperately tried to keep his head up during this torment. Shockingly, an autopsy revealed that Bird remained alive for a significant portion of the ordeal. Bird's horrifying journey ended tragically about halfway along the route, when his right arm and head were severed as his body struck a culvert. Astonishingly, although almost all of his ribs were fractured, his brain and skull remained intact, indicating that he had likely remained conscious for much of the torment. Following this nightmarish episode, Barry, Brewer, and King dumped Bird's mutilated remains in front of an African-American cemetery on Huff Creek Road and callously continued on to a barbecue. A motorist discovered Bird's decapitated remains the following day. At the site where the dragging had occurred, investigators found a wrench with Barry inscribed on it, as well as a lighter bearing Possum, King's prison nickname. The heinous nature of the crime, combined with Brewer and King's well-known affiliation with white supremacist beliefs, prompted state law enforcement to classify it as a hate crime. The Federal Bureau of Investigation was brought in less than 24 hours after Bird's remains were discovered due to the extreme circumstances of the case. All three perpetrators, Barry, Brewer, and King, were tried and convicted for James Bird Jr.'s murder. Brewer and King received the death penalty while Barry was sentenced to life in prison. Brewer was executed by lethal injection on September 21, 2011. John King bore racist tattoos, including a disturbing image of a black man hanging from a tree, Nazi symbols, Aryan pride, and the insignia of the Confederate Knights of America, a white supremacist inmate gang. In a letter intercepted by jail officials, King expressed pride in the murder and acknowledged the possibility of facing death for his actions, declaring, regardless of the outcome of this, we have made history, death before dishonor. Sieg Heil. He he also referenced The Turner Diaries, a notorious white supremacist novel during the attack. He was a racist, and never did he show remorse for his actions. King claimed that Barry had dropped King in their shared apartment before they beat Bird and dragged him to death, but the prosecution had enough evidence against him. In a jail note sent to Lawrence Brewer, John King expressed his belief that the clothes confiscated by the police from their apartment may not have had bloodstains, but he did acknowledge that his sandals might have had a dark brown substance on them. King further told Brewer, seriously, though, bro, regardless of the outcome of this, we have made history and shall die proudly remembered if need be. Much Aryan love, respect, and honor, my brother-in-arms, as detailed in a court filing. In a last-minute attempt to save John King from execution, his attorney argued that a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision entitled his client to a new trial due to his original lawyer's failure to assert his claim of innocence to the jury, despite King's insistence on his innocence. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals narrowly rejected this appeal in a five-on-four ruling on Monday. However, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against stopping the execution, making the decision about 30 minutes after the scheduled execution time on Wednesday. Following the ruling, John King was taken from a holding cell and placed on a gurney in the death chamber, where he was connected to an IV. He had no personal witnesses present at his execution and chose not to deliver any final words. However, he had prepared a written statement beforehand, which read, Capital punishment, them without the capital get the punishment. At 6.56 p.m., King was administered a lethal dose of pentobarbital, and he was pronounced dead just 12 minutes later, according to the prison department. James Von Brunn. Von Brunn, a known white supremacist, Holocaust denier, and neo-Nazi, had a prior conviction dating back to 1981 when he unlawfully entered the Federal Reserve Building while carrying a variety of weapons. James Wenneker Von Brunn was born in St. Louis, Missouri, as the eldest of two children. His father worked as a superintendent at the Skull and Steel Mill in Houston during World War II, while his mother was a piano teacher and homemaker. Von Brunn attended Washington University in St. Louis, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in journalism in April 
April 1943. During his time at the university, he was the president of the Sigma Alpha Epsilon chapter and played varsity football. He served in the United States Navy from 1943 to 1957, commanding PT Boat 159 during World War II and receiving commendations and three battle stars. Following his military service, he worked in advertising and production in New York City for two decades. In the late 1960s, he relocated to Maryland's Eastern Shore, continuing his work in advertising and taking up painting. In the early 1970s, Von Brunn briefly worked for Noontide Press, associated with the Holocaust-denying Institute for Historical Review. His arrest history goes back to at least the mid-1960s, including a 1968 jail sentence in Maryland for a fight with a sheriff and a 1966 arrest for driving under the influence after an altercation at a restaurant. Von Brunn's most notable arrest occurred in 1981, when he attempted to kidnap and take hostage members of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, armed with a revolver, knife, and sawed-off shotgun. He described this act as a citizen's arrest for treason. He was convicted in 1983 on charges of burglary, assault, weapons violations, and attempted kidnapping, serving six and a half years in prison before his release in September 1989. Afterward, he briefly became a member of Mensa International, but was later dropped for non-payment of dues. Leading up to the museum shooting, Von Brunn remained actively engaged in propagating anti-Semitic views, showing no signs of mellowing with age. In the early 2000s, he even established his own website, known as the Holy Western Empire site, primarily serving as a platform to promote his self-published anti-Semitic book. Von Brunn's deep-seated anti-Semitism stemmed in part from a long-standing belief that Jews had systematically persecuted him, from undermining his career to even setting his house on fire. He asserted, over the years of my adversity, it became clear to me that there was a Jewish strategy in play, kill the best Gentiles. In one of his essays, he issued a call to action to Americans. It's up to you. Stop talking. Organize. Take action. Targets are scattered all around. You understand their murderous intentions. You know who they are. Do it. This wasn't the first time Von Brunn had expressed such sentiments. In 2004, in an issue of the white supremacist newspaper War, he went so far as to declare a war against Jewry, announcing his hostility toward the Jewish race and its institutions, assets, and resources. Much of Von Brunn's anti-Semitism was encapsulated in his self-published book from 2002, Tob Shebi Goyim Herog, To Kill the Best Gentiles, which he described as the racialist guide for the preservation and nurturing of the white gene pool. Its central thesis echoed the familiar refrain of white supremacists for decades, that Jews were on a mission to destroy all Gentile nations through miscegenation and warfare, and that the Zionist-occupied government of the United States was actively facilitating this by welcoming large numbers of fecund non-white immigrants to dilute the white race through interracial procreation. After reading his book, one white supremacist even hailed von Brunn as a white racialist treasure. He was assigned a Federal Bureau of Prisons ID and was incarcerated at the Federal Correctional Complex in Butner, North Carolina. But before he could stand trial and get an official sentencing, he passed away in a nearby hospital on January 6, 2010, due to long-standing health issues including sepsis and chronic congestive heart failure, according to his attorney. Attorney's statement. David Copeland. But, uh, my, uh, damage given the news. Top story, man. David Copeland, also known as the Nail Bomber, was a homophobic Nazi who set up an explosion that killed people and hoped that his act would set fire to the country and stir up a racial war. David Copeland masterminded a series of bombings that occurred in London in April 1999. He first targeted Brixton with a bomb near the market, injuring 48 people. Then secondly, he targeted Brick Lane, but was mistakenly timed for a quieter day, injuring 13 people when it exploded after being brought to a police station. The third bomb was planted in Soho's Admiral Duncan pub, killing three, injuring 79, mainly in London's gay community. Born on May 15, 1976 in Hanworth, located in the London borough of Hounslow to a working-class couple, his father worked as an engine driver while his mother was a homemaker. Copeland spent most of his childhood with his parents and two brothers in Yately, Hampshire. He attended Yately School, where he earned seven GCSEs before leaving in 1992. During his teenage years, Copeland reportedly grappled with concerns about his sexuality, even interpreting innocent messages from his parents, like singing along to the Flintstones theme as signals about his sexual orientation. Later in his teens, he developed an interest in heavy metal music and acquired the moniker Mr. Angry. According to journalist Nick Ryan, 
It's as if he became invisible to the school staff during this period. Following his arrest after the bombings, Copeland disclosed to psychiatrists that he had been experiencing sadomasochistic dreams since the age of 12. These dreams included fantasies of being reincarnated as an SS officer with power over women as slaves. He left school and attempted various jobs, often attributing the challenging job market to immigrants. Copeland also became entangled in minor criminal activities, along with struggles with alcohol and drug abuse. Eventually, his father secured him a position as an engineer's assistant on the London Underground. Copeland said that he worked alone and did not discuss the plan with anyone. He held neo-Nazi views and wanted to spread fear and trigger a race war. My main intent was to spread fear, resentment, and hatred throughout this country. It was to cause a racial war. He said, if you've read the Turner Diaries, you know the year 2000, there'll be the uprising and all that. Racial violence on the streets. My aim was political. It was to cause a racial war in this country. There'd be a backlash from the ethnic minorities. Then all the white people will go out and vote BNP. His mental condition underwent evaluation at Broadmoor Hospital, where five psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, while one concluded that he had a personality disorder that was not severe enough to exempt him from a murder charge. There was consensus that he suffered from mental illness, but the extent of this condition and whether it absolved him of responsibility for his actions became points of contention. At the Old Bailey, Copeland's guilty plea to manslaughter based on diminished responsibility was not accepted by the prosecution or the jury. On June 30, 2000, Copeland was found guilty of three counts of murder and planting explosive devices, resulting in him receiving six life sentences. The presiding judge expressed doubts about the possibility of ever safely releasing Copeland. Subsequently, on March 2, 2007, the High Court determined that Copeland should remain incarcerated for a minimum of 50 years effectively ruling out any chance of release until at least 2049, when he would be 73 years old. Copeland appealed this decision, and on June 28, 2011, the Court of Appeal upheld the earlier ruling. While incarcerated at HM Prison Belmarsh, his penchant for violence would not stop. In June 2014, Copeland assaulted another inmate using a shiv, a makeshift weapon crafted from razor blades affixed to a toothbrush handle. He admitted to the charge of causing intentional harm in October 2015, and was subsequently handled and an additional three-year prison sentence, with a requirement to serve 18 months of that term. In August 2020, Netflix announced a documentary that was going to be about Copeland and the nail bomb attacks. But in 2021, the news reported that while in prison, Copeland had converted to Islam and even took the name Saddam. He hoped that his new faith would give him a second chance in life. Fraser Glenn Miller Jr. Fraser Glenn Miller Jr., born on November 23, 1940, and passing away on May 3, 2021, was commonly known as Glenn Miller or Fraser Glenn Cross. He was an American domestic terrorist and the leader of the now defunct White Patriot Party, formerly known as the Carolina Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Miller was convicted of murder, along with various criminal charges related to firearms possession and the violation of an injunction against paramilitary activities. He frequently ran for public office and espoused beliefs in white nationalism, white separatism, Odinism, and anti-Semitism. Frazier Glenn Miller Jr., originally from North Carolina, left high school and enlisted in the United States Army, where he dedicated 20 years of his life and eventually achieved the rank of Master Sergeant. He served two tours of duty in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Miller's introduction to white racialist politics came when he obtained a copy of The Thunderbolt, a newsletter published by Edward Reed Fields of the National States Rights Party, which had been given to him by his father. He actively participated as a member of the National Socialist Party of America during the Greensboro Massacre that took place on November 3, 1979. Consequently, he was discharged from the U.S. Army later that same year due to his involvement in distributing racist propaganda. On April 13, 2014, Frazier Glenn Miller Jr. became the sole suspect in a shooting spree that occurred earlier that day in suburban Kansas City, resulting in the tragic deaths of three people. The shootings took place both outside the Jewish Community Center and near a retirement home called Village Shalom in Overland Park, Kansas. The victims of the Jewish Community Center shooting were William Lewis Corporan and his his 14-year-old grandson, Reet Griffin Underwood, both of whom were United Methodist Christians. Another victim, Terry Lamano of Kansas City, was killed in the parking lot of Village Shalom, where her mother resided. Lamano was also a Christian who attended St. Peter's Catholic Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Several others were shot at, including one Jewish individual who escaped without injuries. During the shootings and his subsequent arrest, Miller reportedly shouted, Heil Hitler. According to Miller's wife, he had gone to a Missouri casino the afternoon before the shootings and called 
called her the next morning to say he was doing well. The shootings occurred less than three hours after this phone call. Miller claimed he began planning the shootings in late March because he believed he was dying from emphysema. Miller consistently asserted, both during the trial and in subsequent interviews with the media, that he deliberately targeted Jewish individuals when he visited those locations. It is worth noting, however, that all three of his victims were Christians. During his trial, Miller was permitted to act as his own defense, a decision that led to several controversial incidents. He questioned witnesses about their Jewish identity and was reprimanded by the judge for uttering Sieg Heil, distributing anti-Semitic literature to reporters and making unusual objections, such as challenging witnesses' oaths. He also utilized his closing arguments to voice grievances about what he believed to be Jewish control of the government. Miller's attorneys proposed a plea deal where he would plead guilty to first-degree murder and accept life imprisonment without parole, but the district attorney rejected this offer outright. He represented himself during the trial, making unusual objections, such as challenging witnesses' oaths. He and his supporter, neo-Nazi Alex Linder, attempted to present justifications for his actions but were largely unsuccessful. On August 31, 2015, Miller was found guilty of multiple charges, including capital murder and attempted murder. A Kansas jury recommended the death penalty on September 8, 2015. On November 10, 2015, he was formally sentenced to death. Subsequently, Miller's legal team has contended, including in a recent hearing in March 2021, that his death sentence should be overturned. They argue that either the trial court should not have allowed him to represent himself or should have permitted standby attorneys to intervene. The court stated it would hold a hearing to assess potential legal issues. However, Miller died soon after. His death renders the appeal moot. Anders Bering Breivik Fjotolf Hansen, born on February 13, 1979, and better known by his birth name Anders Bering Breivik, is a domestic terrorist from Norway with far-right affiliations. He gained notoriety for carrying out the 2011 Norway attacks on July 22, 2011. During these attacks, he detonated a van bomb in Oslo, resulting in the deaths of eight people. Subsequently, he went on a mass shooting spree on the island of Utoya, where he killed 69 participants of a workers' youth league, AUF, summer camp. Upon the arrival of the Oslo Police Tactical Unit Delta on the island, Breivik surrendered without putting up any resistance. Following his arrest, he was detained on the island and subjected to interrogation throughout the night before being transferred to a holding cell in Oslo. During questioning, Breivik confessed to his horrific crimes. He stated that the purpose of his attack was to protect Norway and Western Europe from what he perceived as a Muslim takeover. He expressed that the Labour Party had to pay the price for their alleged failures in safeguarding Norway and its people. After his arrest, Breivik even referred to himself as the greatest monster since Quisling. Breivik, while in court, delivered Nazi salutes to the judge and attendees, confirming his Nazi beliefs, but renouncing violence. He expressed intentions to establish a Nazi political party and run for parliament. The trial featured witnesses like Par Oberg, a Swedish politician linked to the Nordic resistance movement, and retired psychiatrist Randy Rosenqvist, who met Breivik in 2017. Breivik contested her expertise and asserted his focus on business plans and studies. In April 2012, Breivik, deemed mentally fit for trial, faced his criminal proceedings, culminating in a conviction in July 2012. He was found guilty of mass murder, causing a fatal explosion, and terrorism. His sentence, the maximum Norwegian civilian criminal penalty, amounted to 21 years of imprisonment with the provision for preventive detention extensions if he continued to pose a threat to society. Interestingly, Breivik, refusing to acknowledge the court's legitimacy, chose not to appeal but surprisingly sought parole in 2022, which was subsequently denied, leading to an appeal. In January 2022, the Telemark District Court within Skien Prison hosted a three-day trial to deliberate the district attorney's parole denial. Prosecutors argued against parole on grounds of public safety. During the trial, prison advisor Emily Crokan testified about Breivik's monitored correspondence and his use of antidepressants, revealing the limitations on his interactions via postal letters. Assistant Warden Espen Jambach shed light on Breivik's missions and prospects for rehabilitation. On the third day, Breivik's lawyer emphasized the necessity for improved prison treatment, advocating for rehabilitation and progression. The verdict, handed down on February 1st, depicted Breivik as obviously mentally disturbed and delved into the complexity of his mindset. The court's decision addressed Breivik's claims while raising questions about the adequacy of his prison conditions. Since August 2011, Breivik has been confined in a high-security SHS prison section. In March 2022, he was moved 
moved to Ringerike Prison with conditions remaining unchanged. His previous transfers involved stints at Ila Detention and Security Prison, Skian Prison, and back to Ila. Starting in 2015, a military chaplain visited Breivik every two weeks. Breivik's mother visited him five times before her passing in 2013, and researcher Matthias Gardel interviewed him in 2014. Regrettably, other requested visitors have not been granted access. Breivik's confinement is marked by isolation from other inmates, with his primary interactions being with healthcare workers and guards. The term relative social isolation, as defined by the European Court of Human Rights, aptly characterizes his situation. Notably, in November 2020, he had a brief interaction with another prisoner, engaging in card games and conversations lasting one to two hours. In 2016, he asserted that his solitary confinement violated his human rights, a claim contested by the Norwegian justice system. He filed a complaint with the European Court of Human Rights, which dismissed his case in 2018. Within his cell, Breivik has access to an electric typewriter and an Xbox devoid of internet connectivity. Previously, he was permitted a computer without internet access in his cell, a privilege revoked in 2012. Breivik embarked on a political science bachelor's degree at the University of Oslo and successfully completed two courses in 2015. Later, he claimed that harsh prison conditions compelled him to abandon his academic pursuits. Dylan Roof. Dylan Storm Roof, born on April 3, 1994, is an American white supremacist, neo-Nazi, and mass murderer. He was convicted for the Charleston church shooting that occurred on June 17, 2015, in South Carolina. Roof entered Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church during a Bible study session and tragically killed nine African-American attendees, including senior pastor and state senator Clementa C. Pinckney, while injuring another person. His arrest followed a manhunt and he later admitted to committing the shooting with the intention of sparking a race war. Roof's actions in Charleston have been widely labeled as domestic terrorism. A website called The Last Rhodesian, confirmed to be owned by Roof, emerged three days after the shooting. It featured images of Roof posing with white supremacist and neo-Nazi symbols, alongside a manifesto outlining his extremist views towards various groups, particularly black people. He claimed that his white supremacist beliefs were influenced by the Trayvon Martin case and black-on-white crime. On August 4, 2016, Roof was assaulted by a fellow inmate while in the Charleston County Detention Center. Although he sustained facial and bodily bruises, his injuries were not severe, and he received a medical examination before returning to his cell. The attack Attacker, Dwayne Marion Stafford, aged 25 and facing charges of first-degree assault and strong-arm robbery, managed to exit his unlocked cell, pass through a cell door with a small window, and access Roof in the jail's protective custody unit. Roof was alone as the two assigned detention officers had left temporarily, one on a break and the other attending to a different task. Roof and his lawyer decided not to pursue charges against Stafford. Interestingly, Stafford was released on bond exceeding $100,000 the night after the assault, approximately 18 months following his initial arrest. In federal court, Roof was found guilty of all 33 charges, including hate crimes, related to the shooting on December 15, 2016. He received the death penalty on January 11, 2017. Subsequently, Roof pleaded guilty to state charges in South Carolina, including nine counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder, to avoid a second death sentence. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole for these state charges on April 10, 2017. On May 10, 2017, Judge Gurgle rejected Roof's request for a new trial and unveiled the results of psychiatric evaluations performed by forensic psychiatrist James Ballinger. These evaluations, along with transcripts from competency hearings, all affirmed Roof's fitness to stand trial. The initial evaluation was prompted by a letter Roof wrote to prosecutors in which he vehemently opposed his defense team's strategy to portray him as mentally ill. In the letter, he disparaged his attorneys and dismissed psychology as a Jewish invention. The psychiatric report revealed Roof's lack of empathy for the victim's families, with Roof stating he simply did not care about them. Ballinger's assessment suggested Roof might exhibit autistic traits and possibly had social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, autistic spectrum disorder, mixed substance abuse disorder, depression, historically, and schizoid personality disorder. However, Ballinger affirmed that Roof was mentally competent for trial. Roof's adamant refusal to allow any discussion of autism or other disorders, combined with his determination to prevent anything from detracting from his racially motivated crimes, led Ballinger to conclude that Roof's decisions were primarily motivated by racial prejudice and a desire to protect his public image rather than mental illness. Roof strongly denied having autism, fearing it would harm his reputation as a weirdo. 
Ballinger summarized that Roof's decisions were driven by a desire to maintain his image as someone without mental illness. In January 2020, Roof appealed his death sentence, arguing that his self-representation during the penalty phase of his trial deprived the jury of crucial information about his mental illness. His lawyers referenced the Supreme Court's Indiana v. Edwards ruling, which allows judges to appoint lawyers for defendants lacking mental capacity. On May 25, 2021, Roof's legal team initiated an appeal in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, contending that Roof's mental disorders, including schizophrenia, autism, anxiety, and depression, rendered him unfit to represent himself during the federal trial. They claimed Roof believed white nationalists would rescue him after a race war and that he concealed his mental illness during the trial. On August 25, 2021, the Fourth Circuit unanimously upheld Roof's death sentence, emphasizing the horrifying nature of his crimes. His attorneys appealed this decision on September 10, 2021. However, a federal court declined to hear the appeal case on September 24, 2021, suggesting it should go before the full appeals court. The federal government also opposed the appeals, asserting Roof's conviction and sentencing were proper. In March 2022, Roof's lawyers sought the Supreme Court's intervention to resolve their dispute with their client over the mental illness defense. But on October 11, 2022, the Supreme Court denied the appeal without comment. If you enjoyed this video, then you are going to also love the videos on the cards displayed on the screen. Kindly click on the card for more videos like this.